sewing friends and welcome to another episode of Sewing Online with Salky. Tonight we have a really fantastic program lined up for you with our special guest Jim Suzio. He's got a couple, uh, a great technique to show us about how to make boucle lace and we're going to learn how to make fabric first. Then we're going to learn about how to make fringe followed up by uh, the embroidered version of this technique. So you want to stay until the very end because we have a special sale uh, that's going to last for three hours only and that information is going to come up at the very end. So welcome, Jim. Hi, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Hi. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Jim. What is it that you do in the sewing world? Um. Uh, educator, motivational speaker, author, um, designer, digitizer. Digitizer. <laughs> yes, wonderful. I have to tell you, when I s stitched out the clutch on my on my uh, embroidery machine, this is a fantastic design. I was really, really impressed with it, and I know everyone's going to really love this uh, program tonight. So, are you ready to get started? Sure, let's go. All right. If you have any technical problems this evening, contact Citrix at 855-352-9002. Uh, they'll be able to help you. They have a great uh, team of technical staff that can work your, work your way through any issues that you might have. So if you have any uh, problems with seeing our screen or any audio problems, just call in at 855-352. 352-9002. So this is the boucle lace fabric and this is a close-up picture of this technique that Jim is going to show us. And what you see on the screen is actually a close-up version of the clutch. You will receive instructions to make this type of uh, clutch with your regular sewing machine and a little later we'll talk about embroidery. So Jim, feel free to take it away. Sure, okay. Um, as Michelle said, that's a close-up of the uh, project and actually that one there was working with the blendables as we see in the screen and uh, you get a different type of look to your project by the different threads you will use. So for our project tonight, what we're going to work is with this um, Fabrisolvi, the washaway stabilizer. And we're using this Sulky Cotton Blendable. It's a 30 weight. And of course, you'll need a 90-14 top stitch needle. And if you choose to use a 12 weight, uh, which is a heavier thread, you'll need like 116 jeans. And you'll need extra bo uh, bobbins that are wound, uh, KK2000 spray adhesive, and a water-soluble fabric marker. And to set your machine up, uh, you want to wind a few bobbins with the Salky 30-weight blendables. And just as a reminder, with this technique, the back of your project or the bobbin thread will actually be creating the fabric as well. So you don't want to use like a, a plain bobbin thread. You want to use the blendables again because you will actually be making something reversible. So you can have two totally different looks and the threads don't have to match on either side. Um, also, you want to make sure that your uh, machine has balanced tension. And if your machine is threaded with the 30 blendables, you want to be sure you put the 9014 top stitch needle in. Or if you're using the 12 weight, you want to use the 100 to 16 weight. And also make sure that your machine bobbin case area is clean. You don't want any lint there because if any lint is built up and does get uh, say knocked out by the stitching, it will be actually be adhered to your project. So you want to make sure you have a clean bobbin case area. And to start setting up your machine, you want to use like an applique foot, similar to the one that's shown here. Uh, mine has like a clear insert in the middle. You could be using an open toe when it's all open. But the main thing is to, if you turn your foot over and look at the back of it or the bottom of the foot, you want to make sure that there's an open groove area and that is uh, created to allow the threads to flow easily underneath the presser foot. So all the weight of the presser foot is on the sides of the foot, 
not in the center where all the stitches are being created. So it's important to use a foot similar to that. And to prepare our fabric that we're going to stitch on, we're going to be using uh, the Salty KK2000. And I would recommend, since this is going to be a free motion technique on the machine, you want to use two layers. And quite often what I'll do is whenever I take it on my package, I'll cut two pieces and then rotate one 90 degrees. This way they're on a different grain. And I noticed that I had less pull or shifting of the uh, stabilizers this way. And you also notice that on my picture there that I have the stabilizer still kept within the uh, packaging that it comes in. And I actually like to keep it that way. It actually opens up like a little dispenser so I can pull it out like I'm using plastic wrap in the kitchen. Um, and also whenever I'm done with my uh, Fabrisolve in that container, I usually save them because they're a great way to store threads or any kind of sewing accessory, especially if you're traveling and you need some kind of container to keep all your threads organized. It's a great way to recycle them and reuse them. And what we have here is uh, we're going to do a test sample first to see what uh, adjustments we may need to do on our machine, if we um, need to do any more stitching to make it a little fuller look. So we're just going to do a three inch trial square. So you want to, on the square of your stabilizer, just draw a three inch square uh, using your water soluble marker. And uh, one of the things that's important to find out is how much relaxation that your project has, and that's why we're doing a test one. The stitch pattern we're going to choose is a stipple stitch similar to the one I have up here. And I probably should precedent that I'm not using like the newest, greatest, top of the line machine to do this technique on. I'm using a, like a 15 to 20 year old machine with a stipple stitch that was pre-programmed in. I like this one because it had curved and a lot of wiggly lines all through it. If you don't have that exact stitch on your machine, that's fine. Um, you could use one that's even more angular, so just something similar. This one comes up at 9 millimeters, and the settings you see here are what it came up with pre-programmed. If yours doesn't do 9 millimeters, you just need to make more stitching rows. If it's wider, you can actually do less. And in this case, I just chose it the way it was, which is a 4 millimeters wide oh, sorry, length and 90 millimeters wide for the pattern. And you can see on the left, that's how it's pre-programmed by the factory built into the machine. And on the right, I increased the stitch length, which I like better. Um, the reason being is that the threads weren't clustering over each other, making it a little bulkier. I like the little smoother look to this because once we start layering, you're not going to get heavy build-up areas. It's going to be an all-consistent type of weight across your whole project. So in this case, I increased my length to a look I liked. And also notice, too, that I have both the needle and bobbin threads on top of the stabilizer. And that's one of the important things to do is when you first start your project, you want to bring the thread tails of the bobbin up to the top surface and make sure you leave them in place for now, because it's going to be a nice reference point when you're working on your project. You'll know exactly where you started on your square. And like I said, there you pull the bobbin threads up and make sure the bobbin thread and needle thread are under the left side of the presser foot. This way the presser foot is holding them in place and it's not going to let them drop back down into the bobbin case area. And uh, I also want to set my foot just so that it's right on the left line of my square. And if I have like an auto fix or auto tie on, uh, feature on my machine, I'm going to turn that off for right now because I don't want that not to be there. I want to be the one that decides where and when I'm going to tie on and off. So you're going to shut that off. You're just going to use the basic features on the machine. And again, with the threads under the presser foot and the left open toe area of the foot right along the lines of the drawn square. And what we're going to do is we're going to stitch along one long side of the drawn pattern. And as you can see in the picture there, where there's a slot between the metal toe and the plastic insert, I'm right on that line there. 
and you can see there's the first row of stitching complete. Um, the stitching just kind of went just along the line, which is good. And if you notice in the left part of the picture where the thread tails are, it looks like they were over sewn a little bit. They were. That's how you tie on and tie off. You just over sew your thread tails. What I found with this technique is you can actually cut this fabric and it has little to no fray at all. So it will tie itself on in position. So you just sew one side and then we'll be ready to pivot and come back the opposite side. And you can see here we kind of walk the needle over a little bit to turn and come back. And you want to overlap the rows no more than an eighth. A quarter is okay, but you want to kind of keep it so where they just overlap. Again, you don't want too bulky a look or striping. So again, you're going to turn around and then come back alongside the previous stitching overlapping about an eighth of an inch. And you can see here, there's that second row done. We have a couple of open areas. That's fine because they're going to be filled in. And you're going to be continuing doing the same thing, going back and forth across each row, uh, pausing to pivot, uh, maneuver, maneuvering your stitches over a little bit just so you're within the square. And you want to try to stay within your drawn square lines. And again, when you reach the, t the end of your line, you're going to stop, turn, pivot, and then come back down again, overlapping about an eighth of an inch. And you can see even in this picture here, we have three rows done, and it's kind of filling in. And here we have the total square done. But notice on the left, there's a little bit of a gap that we didn't go all the way to the line. That's fine, because as we fill this in, on my sample, I did it four times every bit of it's covered. And in fact, it's okay to have it a little lighter on the side like that. So again, you're just going to keep covering over with your last stitches. And don't worry if you have a little extra space on the left. And we're going to do the quarter turn again. Notice on the upper right-hand corner where the thread tails are. That's where I originally started. So now you can tell I turned and pivot, and I came down and did one row in the opposite direction, and you're going to keep doing that same process, overlapping the first layer. So you're rather weaving these threads together. And you can see here you, on the right how it's really kind of weaving itself together there to create the fabric. And you're going to continue to do the same technique, going back and forth, overlapping about an eighth of an inch, turning and pivoting at each end to continually fill up that entire square. It looks a little messy, it might look a little odd, but it's going to make a lot of sense when you get done with it. And you, here you can see that third row of stitching. And there's my thread tails in the bottom right hand corner. And again, whenever I finish that row, there was a little bit of a gap. That's fine because it's going to be filled right in. And you could, if you notice on the sides that a couple places I kind of went over a stitch or two, you're going to find out when we're done, it's all going to be smooth and even because we got a little fix for that. And you're just going to continually fill in that whole square until you complete the look of the third row. And there again is a close-up of right there's your thread tails. They're already worked in uh, and they're secure. But again, I'm going to leave them because that's my reference so I know where I started. And then once you finish the third row, you can check your work. Um, if you see any open areas, you can go ahead and do it a fourth time, which is like I did with mine. I like that a little heavier. Um, if you see this a specific spot, you could walk the needle over just by taking several stitches and then filling it in, or you can leave it a little more airy or more lacy. So if you want it a little denser, you want to do it a fourth time, again, doing the entire sewing and pivoting of each row. And that will give you like a heavier body of fabric for your pattern. And this is the uh, three inch square filled in four times. As you can see, I have the thread tails at the bottom right-hand corner now. 
And the edges don't look as neat as I would like them, so we're going to be fixing that in a little bit. And by fixing them, we're going to do a different choice of stitch. I looked at my sewing machine, and I had a stitch on the left-hand picture there of loops, where one side has almost a straight line, and the left side of it is more of like a pico edge. And that's the one I chose to work with. Whenever I edge stitch a square or a project I'm working on, I will make sure that the right-hand side that's more straight is along the finished edge of my project, or in this case, our square. And the pico loops are going to go into the body of the stitching. That's going to help it fill in and give it a much smoother edge on the edge of my project. But that particular stitch, as it came up on my machine, was a little heavy and close. So what I chose to do was to increase the stitch length, as you see on the right, where it's a little more loopier, and it will blend in better with the bouquet fabric. And I'll probably go over the edge twice. And this way, it'll blend in even more smoothly, and you'll have a nice, clean, finished edge that'll help it to lay nice and flat as well. And when you line it up, you're going to have your pattern start along the edge of the finished square. And you're going to go all the way around the four sides of the raw edge. And we're going to do it twice, like I said, to fill in. And you want to make sure that the straight side or smoother side of that stitch pattern is along the outside edge of my square. And that all the loops will flow into the body of the stitching we just created. And you can see here that there's some rough edges there, but once you go around it twice, they're going to disappear. And you can see here, after two rows of stitching, I got a much cleaner edge. And now it's OK to trim your thread tails. And uh, you have like a nice, completed, finished piece of fabric that's ready for um, cleaning up of getting ready of the stabilizer. And this is the back. And as you can see, I used an orange thread in my bobbin. And you see little flecks of black, which was the needle thread, which is fine. So you're going to have like a really unique look on the back side. With this technique on a, a standard sewing machine, you can create your own one-of-a-kind fabric with one color of thread in your needle and a totally different color in your bobbin to have two complete different reversible looks to your project. And the final step is removing the Fabrisolve. And what you want to do is fill a container with warm water. And I like to add a little bit of detergent, like laundry detergent, or you may want to use a, di a good quality dish detergent. Just a couple drops in it, um, agitate it slightly, then place your completed project in the water, agitate it for a little bit. And I let it to sit for a little while until the stabilizer is gone. The reason I like to use detergent in my project is I find that it removes every bit of the Fabrisolve with one wash. And traditionally, um, when you read the directions, they may tell you just to rinse it with clear water. And my the problem I had was traveling the United States that it seems like every location had different water treatment plants, and they added different things to their water. And the Fabrisolve always didn't come out with the first rinse. So I had to rinse and rinse and rinse. And I found that if I would use a little bit of detergent, it kind of counteracted all the additives that our local water treatment plant put in. And this way, I could wash every bit of it out with one single wash. So I usually just use a little bit of detergent, let it soak um, a little bit, rinse it out, and then lay it flat to dry. And as you can see in the pictures there, the top picture, my finished square was three inches that I worked on. But you notice in the bottom one, it's not three inches. It's more like two and three quarters. And that's because when the Fabrisolve is all dissolved away, that shows how much relaxation I have in my project. And that's a big difference between relaxation and shrinkage, because shrinkage 
as the term implies, means the fabric, or in this case the threads, shrink. And they don't. It's actually the technique, because you're stitching on a sound foundation of Fabrisolvi, and once that Fabrisolvi is dissolved away, it's allowing all the threads to be in a relaxed state, and they somewhat pull back to a normal state, since they're not being held in place in that specific pattern. And that's why if your stipple stitch is more angular, it's still going to end up having a curved edge to it and be more relaxed. So in my case, I found out with that stitch pattern and that setting I chose, my relaxation was about a quarter of an inch for every three inches. So if I'm going to make a bigger project, let's say a clutch or purse, a scarf or even fabric, I can then figure out how much bigger I need to cut my fabric solving and work with it that way so that my project will turn out to be the final size that I desire it to be. And as you can see here in this picture, I was experimenting with the different weights of threads and I used the sulky 40 weight rayon thread in the needle in the bobbin and got a totally different lighter look to my project. And I was using uh, various tones on one side for more of an ombre look, where the other side is much more lighter. And of course, it has the added detail of the fringe. So if you want to make fringe, either for this project or let's say for a, a, a pillow or whatever you're working on, um, you're going to have the similar setup as you were for making your regular fabric. We have two layers of fabric solving, and we're going to draw um, two lines that are three inches apart, and I did six vertical lines that are a half inch apart. The first time we did a, a perfect square, but here these lines are what we're going to be stitching along. So that's going to be our reference point. So everywhere you see a line going up and down, that's going to be our fringe. The top line, that's going to be our header. That's what we are going to be building this, the fringe strips or ribbons from and where we can attach it to our project. And the bottom line is for reference only, so that I can have like a consistent length for all of my fringe ribbons. All right, with the presser foot now centered, and then on my foot it's that center red line, I'm going to have it right on that top line, and I'm going to do a row of the stipple stitches, and it's the same stipple stitch I used to create my fabric across the top heading of the fringe. And when you get to the end, you're going to like raise your presser foot and pivot the fabric so you're going to come back on top of the same line you just sewed. Before we were going beside it, this time we're going directly on top. So you want to make sure that your foot is centered squarely on top of the previous line of stitching and you're going to come and sew back down where we started from. And again, we can see our starting point because we have our threads on top. And here I went ahead and pivoted and sewed down to my reference line or the bottom of the fringe. And I did the same thing as I did for the header. You're going to center the foot on the line, sew straight to the edge of that line or reference point, stop, raise your presser foot, spin the fabric around, lower the foot, and sew back up on the exact same line of stitching you just did. And one thing I probably should mention too, on a lot of our machines we have like that pattern restart where it'll sew at the very first stitch in that pattern. If it, you feel more comfortable using that, you can go ahead and use it. If your machine doesn't have it, doesn't matter. Just keep sewing wherever the pattern turns up. It'll still look great. And again, that bottom line is for reference only. We're not going to sew it. And you can see here, we've already done four rows of fringe. And again, we're going to continue to do the last two with our presser foot centered on that line, sewing to the bottom line, which is again for reference only, not going to sew it. And then we'll go back up into the header, sew across the header a little bit, and then come down to the last or sixth row of this sample of fringe.
Jim? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to make sure that you're there. Um, you see the, the we have the next slide okay. up? Okay. Yes, now it came up. It seemed like it froze for a second there. Okay. okay, once you have all of your fringe ribbons stitched, you notice again that they were, the edge is a little rough and uh, it's not as full as it could be. Well, instead of doing it like two more times, we're going to do that same scallop elongated pattern that we use to finish the edges of our square by finishing the sides of the ribbon. So again, I'm going to go and as you can see in that first piece, that ribbon strip has already been completed with the scallops on both sides. So I'm going to line my presser foot up with the right hand side of the second ribbon that's on the right. So down it, go across the bottom and up the left side of it to complete the look and give it a nice fuller look to the fringe. More like the body weight of the blue pig sample we made earlier. And there's the completed fringe front, again with all the fringe ribbons, as I call them, all completely stitched and edge stitched with that little scallop stitch that gives it a nice clean look. And when you flip it over, there's the matching back to our square. Again, I used orange in my bobbin. And you can see little flecks of black in it. It's almost like poppy seed stippling, as I call it. And this one is ready to be put into the sink and washed out and then applied to my project. Or if you were making a larger project, you could just make that as part of your original piece and just instead of stitching it back on separately. And to give you a couple ideas of what you could do with that fabric square, you may want to go and try to make your own beret, as the pictures here show. And if one of the first places to start is your pattern. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I didn't have a pattern, like a commercially made pattern for my beret hat. I was at my Aunt Sunny's house, and she's the lady pictured on the left. She had a favorite beret that she loved to wear. Well, when she was out of the room, I traced it and uh, got the those pattern pieces and then what I did was I traced them onto my fabric solvey but I of course enlarged it because I know of the relaxation that my machine has. Went and sewed out I believe eight panels and then seamed them together, made the brim in a similar fashion, sewed that on, washed it out and I made her a one-of-a-kind beret that went with her coat that she loved to wear. And uh, at the model on the right, that's my daughter Mary, and she's wearing the machine embroidered version of the same technique where these pieces were all constructed within the embroidery hoop. But again, I didn't have a pattern for this. I just traced out a favorite hat pattern. And then again, for the brim, did the same technique where I traced it out, made it a little larger. And I sewed the brim out twice and then sandwiched them together and then stitched it in this way, it gave that heavier hand to the, like most brims do on a hat. And uh, these samples here, I wanted to go experiment and the inspiration was I had gone into the shopping mall and gone into one of those expensive candle stores where they had some gorgeous etched glass candle holders that look like what they call cracked ice. And I looked at it and I thought I could do that in thread. So I went home and I used my sulky clear invisible polyester thread in the top in the bobbin and did a layer. Then I changed uh, my bobbin thread to the opalescent silver and did a couple test sew outs. And what you see here is just that clear invisible thread and some opalescent making my own cracked ice. After I stitched out my square, I dampened it. I didn't wash out the stabilizer. I wanted to keep it dissolved in the threads because once I dampened it, I wrapped it wet on my candle holder and allowed it to dry on the candle holder. This way it actually kind of glued itself 
to the glass and it became one and this way when you have it illuminated it has that cracked ice look that the expensive candle store has and I play with some other colors and like on the right hand picture you see there I did an awareness ribbon so if you have a cause or whatever like in this case we did a gray for diabetes that uh, you can have your own uh, specific awareness type candle wrap. And what's nice with this technique is that when you just wrap it onto the candle, if you decide to change it or if, let's say, the, the glass bottle got broken, you can easily peel it off and then dampen it and reapply it to another bottle. And it'll work just as great. And for the setup of your machine, you might, again, you want to do a little test sample to make sure that uh, your machine will accept those threads. I had no trouble with mine, but you may want to do a little test out just to be sure. Thanks, Jim. Well, this is a fantastic technique, and I really, really love this. I'm so glad that you uh, agreed to come on here and show us how to do this. Um, Patty, are you there? Patty, will, if she's uh, out there, she's got to take herself off mute. But um, so uh, in your handout section, you will see that we have a couple handouts for you this evening. And one of them is the manual version of how to do uh, a purse. Uh, using the technique that Jim just showed you. Uh, it will show you how to make the pattern portion of it. And Jim uh, gave us an idea of how you would work with a pattern when you're making uh, uh, something with the boucle lace. So it's really just a fabric and you can cut it without having to worry about it fraying around or you can work with uh, the pattern piece um, to the shape that you need. So Patty, have you been able to come Break free from the questions? <laughs> yes, I'm here. You know, I might be the way answering all these questions, and then all of a sudden I'm up. So <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I can, I can always find something to talk about. Yes, we count on you, Michelle. So one of the things I wanted to mention um, are some of the top questions that are coming in, and, and I've been answering them to everybody, so everybody gets the answers. And we also prepare a question and answer sheet that will be downloadable that covers all these things that I'm answering tonight, as well as some things that I don't have the answers for. There's been a couple that Jim are going to have to answer. Jim is going to have to answer. But no problem. <laughs> that's, that's our Jim. Um, one of the questions I got, which was kind of a good question, and you may have seen me answer it, was why doesn't it fall apart? Well, it doesn't fall apart because you're overlapping all your stitches and then you're going the other direction and stitching them in the other direction layer two and then you do the same thing in the opposite direction layer three and if you need to layer four so you've essentially made a mesh almost like a chain link fence but mini and it's not going to come apart when you link all those stitches together like that so right. I know that's important I know all of us have done things that we washed the water soluble away and it did come apart this won't um, one of the other questions that I had is, well, I don't have a stipple stitch on my machine. Well, Jim can talk, speak to this also. I've used a honeycomb stitch pretty successfully. It's, it's narrower. It takes a little longer to do that. But what you want is a fairly dense stitch that's going to overlap and, and create the kind of thing that the stipple stitch does. It's going to be, it may not be as wide. It may take you more rows, but it will work. And also, uh, another question was, um, does the marker wash away? Well, it does, and we used a permanent ink marker so that you could see it really well, but we suggest that you use a water-soluble marker to be on the safe side, especially when you're using lighter uh, threads. You don't want to have to have a problem with that when you're rinsing it away. So to be safe, just use a water-soluble marker. And I've had a lot of really great questions all night long, and I've been answering like crazy, and you'll all get to see those. And thank you for your patience. Some of you have had a few little technical issues. That's just the nature of the beast. I told somebody I feel like I'm dancing with stars when I'm on a webinar because it's live <laughs> and it's exciting. <laughs> so those were the top questions, and I'll turn it back to Michelle, who will then turn it back to Jim. Oh, and listen, don't leave us. 
don't leave us. Even if you don't have a computerized embroidery machine, you are just going to love watching this project come together computerized. And Jim has some great ideas that he'll share with you that will work for your manual version too. That's right, yes. And uh, like Patty uh, said, the uh, embroidered part has a really cool technique that I've never seen before. And it was just phenomenal building this clutch in the hoop. So as Patty mentioned, um, the, your questions will be answered. We'll provide a downloadable Q&A for you. Uh, we'll be working on that tomorrow morning. And a little bit ago, I told you that there are some handouts in the handout section. Uh, so you can download those. I'll be on the webinar for a little while afterwards, so you don't have to do that now. And um, these are some great things for you to have, but they will also be email to you about an hour after the webinar you'll receive a link to a special area on our website where all of this information will be contained so don't worry about that so let's see what the next slide is Ellen oh yes we have to do a door prize drawing Patty can I call you back and ask you to randomly select a winner for our first door prize. As you can see, we are giving away a copy of the Fun with Salky Blendables and Solid Color Cotton Threads. As a matter of fact, Jim's project that you um, will see and the instructions uh, that we will provide came from this book. And uh, his instructions are on the CD. So if you have this book, you actually have the uh, instructions that we are going to be giving you. You'll also get some Fabrisolvi stabilizer. I absolutely love this type of stabilizer, as well as a package of the Cotton Petite, that's the 12 weight thread. There, are 50 yard, there is 50 yards of thread on a Cotton Petite spool. It's ideal for hand stitching, but you can certainly use it on your, in your sewing machine if you have a little bit of work that you want to do with a heavier weight cotton thread. So Patty, do you have our first winner? Let's give her a second. <laughs> Okay, Patty, are you there? Sorry. That's <laughs> I just okay. had a conversation with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first winner is Carol with a K, K A R R O L L, and her last name is Gates, G A T E S, like our Microsoft friend. Okay, Carol Gates, I will be able to look up your email information after the webinar and we'll, we will be in contact with you to get your mailing address so we can send this prize package out to you. So congratulations, Carol. Thank you, Patty. You're welcome. Okay, now it's time for us to switch gears a little bit and we're going to work with the machine and embroidery design that Jim has digitized. Uh, we'll give you information a little later about where you can purchase this design. It's called the Boucle Lace Clutch. We're going to show you the clutch version of it, though. Uh, Jim has another fantastic technique that is easy to do. Once you master uh, making the clutch, you can easily make the straps uh, for a purse. So Jim, are you there and ready to go? Yep, we're ready. Take it away. Okay. Um, as the screen shows you here, you can use whatever color you want. And uh, I, what I probably should point out is on the left side of the screen where you see the, the reddish pink purse and below that is like a white and black version, that's the same clutch. That's actually the reverse or inside of the other one. This technique is completely reversible using your machine embroidery um, to sew it out. So it, it actually sews up fairly quick. And again, when you work with a balanced tension, you can actually have the backside or reverse of your project be flipped around and it's now the right side. So this technique is completely reversible and it even has the buttonhole built into the design so when you wash out your Faber-Solvay, 
the buttonhole simply opens up. There's no need to use a buttonhole cutter set to cut it open. And it's completely finished within the hoop. And you can even add some details like a, a contrasting embroidery design on the top flap. And uh, you do have to remember to get two buttons to cover because you'll have one button sewn on the outside and one on the inside for when you reverse your clutch inside out, you can still button the closure. And as Michelle mentioned, uh, you can make it into more of a purse with a strap. That's a one-piece continuous strap. So if you want uh, a look like that, you can do that. And the nice thing about the clutch version, that it's a, a quick and simple project that you can make if you have an upcoming wedding. You can make them for the wedding party and even add their monogram on the button itself so that you can have a truly one-of-a-kind unique gift to give the bridal party. You're right about that, Jim. It stitches out in about three hours. At least that was on my big embroidery machine, and I had that set at uh, 600 stitches per minute. So really, that is something that you can make easily in the afternoon. And I just wanted to mention that the cotton blendables thread is available in 126 different colors. So there's a lot of combinations that you can put together. Right, and then you, uh, the way this design is uh, created, um, on the embroidery machine, you have your choice of two versions, one solid color and a second one with four colors, meaning that each layer as it sews out, you can choose a different color. So if you want to create a totally unique blend, you can actually use up to four different shades of blendables in the needle and then four different ones in the bobbin to make a totally different look to your design. So for this spring machine, we're working with a large hoop um, boarding machine, and it'll sew the design out in three sections. And as you can see on the illustration here, the, the one front purse, that's one complete square, but the right-hand side of the design, when it sews out, it's not going to have a finished edge. It's going to be a little lighter, so that when you hoop the second part, that blue area, you're going to overlap that with the one front purse section. And then it'll actually fill in the density and attach the two sections together as one. So it'll look like one large seamless piece of fabric. When that section's completed, you'll then rehoop your stabilizer and start to sew out the, th the third version of the uh, design, which has the flap. And again, where that blue area is, you'll overlap the second body piece onto the third. It'll attach it and then fill in the density as one. And you won't even be able to see the seam because it's worked into the pattern. So you'll create one large piece for your clutch. And this, again, was designed for a 6 by 10 inch embroidery hoop. And um, Again, you could change whatever colors you want your needle and your bobbin for whatever look you're going for, if you want something simple or wild. And here, if you have like a larger or commercial machine, you could do it all in one hooping. And this was done like on a 240 by 400 millimeter embroidery hoop. And you can see that's like the whole body of the clutch with the back and the flap already in as one. So it's actually you're working with one piece of fabric with this that you created. Now if you don't have a machine that has a large hoop capacity, let's say you just got your first embroidery machine and it only does a four inch square, you could still make the clutch. You just got to make it in little pieces. Um, the design comes with every individual piece clearly labeled and you would just Rehoop your embroidery hoop with the uh, Solvi as you're doing each section. You sew out each section at one time, just keeping in mind whatever color you put in your needle and your bob and you want to do for each piece. And you'll sew them out separately. And then once they're all completed, you would then simply trim away the excess Solvi. And then you're going to seam them together to make the fabric. Where in the first one, we did it in three hoopings. The second screen showed you the, how we could do it in one hooping with a commercial machine. But now with your basic home embroidery machine, you could do it with 
12 hoop ins and make the same size finished clutch as the larger machines did. And your supply list is similar to the same project we had before. You're going to work with the Selfie Fabri Solvy Stabilizer. And you're going to be needing like the 30 weight cotton blendables for your needle and of course the 9014 prop stitch needle. And, or if you're going to be working with 12 weight, you're going to want to use the 100 to 16 jeans needle. And of course you're going to have to have extra bobbins on hand that are wound with your bobbin thread of choice. And you're going to need two three quarter inch self covering buttons like the type you would find in your fabric shop. I'd like to point out something here, Jim, and I apologize for this. I didn't notice it earlier. Um, when you make this, um, we mentioned that you need two spools of the 30 weight and three spools of the 12 weight cotton bl blendables thread. You would need the um, king size spool, which is much larger than the one you see here. Um, the king size spool for the 30 weight has 500 yards of thread on each spool and the 12 weight has 330 yards of thread. So yes, this project is uh, uses a lot of thread, but it's really cool that it's made entirely out of thread and that that's all it takes is thread and wash away stabilizer. Sorry for interrupting, Jim, but I just wanted to point that out. Not a problem. Thank you for that. But the thing, too, is that um, you're also making a one-of-a-kind uh, object that you can't buy anywhere. So if you have a special event coming up, and you have a, a specific outfit you're wearing, you need to have that clutch that goes with it or coordinates with it. All you have to do is match up your garment to the selfie uh, blendables and you can make a truly one-of-a-kind, unique design that nobody else has that will really finish off your look. Okay, for the supply list, you're going to make sure you pick up a, uh, like I said, the reversible buttons, one for, sorry, self-cover buttons, one for either side. And again, whatever color is in your needle, you're going to want to do a different color for your verse in your bobbin. And anytime you're rehooping, let's say for the four-inch machine, you want to be sure that you maintain that same color going through the needle and the bobbin until you've completed every square, and as well as your bobbin, sorry, your button covers. And as the picture shows, I have two layers of Fabri-Solvy in my embroidery hoop. And here I'm doing like a large hoop design. And I transferred the um, design to my machine, much like you normally would for any other design. And again, whenever I put the Fabri-Solvy in my stabilizer, I took it off the spool with one layer going up and down, if you will, and another layer going side by side. This way I have my grains going in a different direction, and I had less pull. And um, I noticed less relaxation of my stitches once I took the fabric solvy away. And once you've got it threaded up again, you're going to make sure that you bring your bobbin thread tails to the top. So on your embroidery machine, um, there will be a stitch advance button. Touch that button until the hoop moves to where the first stitch is shown. And if you are savvy with your machine, if you touch the needle down and the needle up, it'll bring your bobbin thread tail right to the top of your project. If you're not comfortable with that, just turn the hand wheel a full rotation. That'll take one stitch and then bring a thread tail right to the top, and you can hold them off to the side as it starts to embroider. The reason you don't want that thread tail to be in the back side is it may make like a little nest or um, it may pick up some lint or whatever. So the best thing to do is to contain it by bringing it to the top. After it sews a few stitches, you could cut the thread tails away. That's the only time I do that. But again, you want to bring your bobbin thread up to the top, let it sew out, let's say 10 stitches, stop your machine, trim your thread tail, and then continue sewing from there. And again, you could use um, 30 or 12 weight blendables for the outside of your purse with the proper needle installed in the machine, the 9014 for 30 weight or the 1116 for the 12. 
and then you want to have several of your bobbins filled with, let's say, your 30-weight cotton blendables for the inside or reverse of your purse. And with this project, you will do want to, I think it took me about eight bobbins full to do the entire project. So you do want to have a couple bobbins fully wound and on the ready for you. And if by chance your bobbin runs out, like here's like the first section of the purse sewed out, I did go through two bobbins on this one, and what I did was whenever my indicator said it was running low in bobbin thread, I just watched the machine, and when I saw it was really to the end, I stopped the machine, carefully moved the hoop, so I took my bobbin out, put in a fresh bobbin, put the hoop back on the machine, I backed up a couple stitches, touched the needle down, needle up, brought the thread tail up, let it start to sew, and then stopped the machine trimmed off the thread tails, and then let it keep sewing. I didn't back stitch. I didn't tie on or tie off. Because of the way these threads are inter sewn together by the different angles and weaves, it actually kind of ties them together, which is why if you ever cut this fabric, you'll get little to no fray. Because of the interweaving of all the stitches, it will not come apart. And you'll notice on the right-hand side of that screen where the density of the stitches is a little lighter, that's your overlap. That's where it's going to go sew into the next section and fill in. And you're going to have the same density across the entire width of your fabric. So you can see here, when I took it off the machine, you can see on the top, bottom, and the left side has a much smoother edge, but the right side is rougher and raw, not as dense, and that's going to be where the overlap is going to be. So if you're not sure of when you're going to put it in the hoop, which is the right side or wrong side, you could use your fabric marker, the water-soluble type, and you can mark on it that this was your left and right so that you know when you go to rehoop it and attach it into the next section, you're not going to attach the wrong portion that's not finished because on this sample here, the top, left, and bottom of that fabric square that we just created has a finished edge. The right hand side is the raw edge and that's what's going to be overlapped and then inter sewn into the next section to give you the right density and to sew the two sections together. All within the embroidery hoop. Okay, when you sew out the next section or the two body part section and you do the first color stop, this is what you're going to see on the screen where it has the first row of stitching, uh, the first row of edge stitching in place. But on the left side, it doesn't look complete. And you can see like there's two lines or brackets that are formed on the left-hand side. Well, that shows you where you're going to lay the first section of the purse into the hoop. And I like to put a little KK2000 on the back side of it and press it in place so those raw edges line up with the raw edges that you can see on the screen here within those two brackets. So again, on the left side of this embroidered rectangle where you see like an extension of stitches across the top and the bottom and nothing in between, those brackets show you this is where you place the first body section on top of the second one, press it in place with your KK2000, and then when the machine starts to sew, it's going to tack that section in place to the body that you're sewing right now, and then it's going to continue to fill in the proper density for the first section and while it sews it into the second section to make them both attached and seamless. And here's a, a really good close-up of the two coming together. Again, on the left-hand side, that was my front purse section. And the part you can see on the right, that's like the current piece that I'm doing or the body of it, where you see those two brackets that we have highlighted there for you. And again, you're going to line up the left section of the purse on top of the current hoop section, which is all in pink. And you're going to have those rough edges lined up within those two brackets. So in the hoop, those two rough edges just meet. That open area that you see between the brackets will be filled with the rough edge of the front purse pattern. And you can like pin them together 
or you could use some KK2000 to spray them and hold them in position. And then once they're in place, you can put the hoop back on the embroidery machine and then have the machine pattern actually sew the two together and then continue to fill in the rest of your fabric. And as you can see here, we completed the second body purse section. And it's all been seen together within the hoop. And you can just uh, take that out of the hoop, set it aside, because we're going to do the top closure part. But you can see here where all the raw edges line up on the top and the bottom. And you have a practically flawless application of the two seam together in one. Once that stabilizer is washed out, all the thread fibers will be blending right together, and you can't even see where the seam is, as it's all been seamed together within the hoop. And here we're preparing to do the flat portion, purse, sorry, portion of the purse. Again, this hoop, the sulky uh, ultra solvy in the hoop, and or sorry, fabric solvy in the hoop. We're going to then do the flat purse section. And when it sews out, it's also going to have the finished top edge and bottom, as the previous portions did, but also the curved flat closure all completed with the buttonhole. And it's going to have its own set of brackets with an open area. You're going to take the two previously stitched sections and line them up again, raw edges even, and the top and the bottom on top of the brackets, either pin or a glue in place with a KK2000. And once they're all lined up, you're ready to return it back to the embroidery machine and have it continue to stitch where it'll again attach the two previous sections to your final flap section and then flawlessly seam the two together as one. So you'll have one large continuous piece of fabric. And here's a graphic to show you, again, the positioning where you have the purse fronts, one, two, and three, all lined up. And again, one overlaps two to complete its sewing, and then two will overlap three to complete the entire purse, all within the embroidery hoop. So when you remove that final section from the embroidery hoop, all three pieces will have been seamed flawlessly together to create one large body of fabric. And then the final part is you're going to go and sew the sides of your clutch up so you can make a complete clutch. And what you're going to look for is a multi-stitch zigzag. Uh, some machines call it a triple stitch or a reinforcement stitch. It looks a lot like a zigzag stitch on your machine. But instead of the machine sewing directly from left to right and back again, it's going to go left several stitches in between and then go to the right. So you're going to have, like in this case, I have three stitches that goes between left and right. So instead of one big stitch, it'll be three little stitches to the right, then three little stitches back to the left. That's your reinforced zigzag or triple stitch. You're going to select that. And I left it the way it came up on my screen because I didn't want it too tight or too wide. And what I'm going to do is use this reinforced zigzag or triple stitch to sew the two raw edges of my clutch together to make it the side seam. And again, I would just take my clutch fabric I created, fold it in thirds, and then I would pin in place the bottom third with, again, the flat part not being attached, and just sew up the sides to complete my purse or clutch. And then again, once you've completed, because I like to sew them together while the, the solvy is still on my threads. So once I have all the stitching completed, I'll remove the excess. I'll again fill a container with warm water, a little bit of detergent, and then I'll place my clutch in the fuzzy water. Let it, I'll agitate it for a couple minutes and then let it sit until it's all completely gone. I'll take it out, rinse it, and then I'll lay it flat to dry. Or if you like, if you have a bigger project or you just want to have it done quickly, you could put it in, let's say, a, uh, a zip-up uh, pillowcase and then pop it into the laundry when you're doing clothes. Because I've done it quite a few times, and I notice that it gets every bit of it out. It doesn't hurt the other clothes in the washer. 
and you come out with it all nice and soft and a really clean project. And again, you can lay it flat to dry, or you could actually toss it in the dryer like I've done. Um, and you can see here that, again, whenever the Fabrisolvi is all washed out, the buttonhole will just magically open up for you. And you want to make sure that you sew out two button covers, again, with the same threads in your needle and your bobbin so the fabrics look the same when you're done. But then when you cover your buttons, you'll cover one with the needle side, and then the second button you'll cover with the bobbin side up. And that way you'll make two reversible buttons, and then you'll sew them on the appropriate side and position of your clutch. And you can see here on the top one, I actually have a scallop design that's on the pattern itself that you could sew out. And if you use a, the same or different color in your bobbin, you will have it reversible. Or if you had a one color in your bobbin case, like I did in this sample, I sewed out the scroll with that same color in my bobbin, it disappears, so you don't see the pattern on the reverse. And in this case, um, we use the three-quarter inch uh, self-covering button that we picked up, and we added a monogram on the button cover itself. So if you want to personalize your clutch, you can do it that way and uh, put a nice little design right on that button cover. And this uh, shows you some, some samples of what you could do with your fabric once you master the technique, or in this case, uh, these are all available embroidery designs where on the one on the left you can see where we have ribbons all punched out through the fabric as an awareness scarf. Uh, the one at the bottom, that's using the same technique with piece symbols all punched through. And as you can see as the one side is flipped over, we use kind of an orange thread in the bobbin and we kept changing the needle thread as we re each section. So we had more of an ombre look to one side of our scarf but then a solid color to the other. And on the far right, we used actually all rayon thread in the needle and a bobbin for an all-over same look with large bubbles basically punched out for the fabric. And the top one shows you again that same technique of using the clear thread, but in this case we also added some rayon embroidery thread to give it a little more body to it to make like a Twilight Pines effect for the look. So again, it's whatever threads you choose to use and you're only limited by your creativity as to what you can come up with with this technique. And uh, that's... Go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. No, I was say, um, so that uh, blue clay lace clutch that we just demonstrated for you in the machine hoop, that is an available embroidery design that's uh, available on my website. And I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yes, and like Jim mentioned, the clutch that you just saw, the embroidery design, is for sale on his website, and he has a special for you. So all you have to do is go to his website at jimsuzio.com and look for the webinar special page, and you'll receive 40% off all the embroidery designs within on his website. And, you know, Jim, I updated um, this slide and I'm not able to show it, but Jim is giving us a free embroidery design. And that free embroidery design is a 3D boucle lace rose. Uh, it uses the technique that he uh, showed to us. Um, you can certainly stitch it out. And then there, he's given us the embroidery uh, pattern for that. And I'm sorry that that picture is not uh, shown on the screen, but it was absolutely lovely. And he was inspired to give us the rose for Mother's Day, uh, which was uh, on Sunday. Yeah. And so again, that, that rose pattern will fit within a four-inch hoop as well. So, and Jim, it, so anybody can sew it out. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just going to give him your email address. Uh, Jim said that you can email him with any questions that you might have. It's jimsuziodesigns at aol.com. I'm sorry, Jim, you can take it away now. Okay. Uh, I was, well, kind of what you said, Michelle, if you have any questions about tonight or, you know, the technique or about the embroidery designs, whatever, you know, email me at jimsuziodesigns at aol.com and I'll be happy to answer them for you. Um, if you go to our website and for whatever reason your browser doesn't work for the, um, the webinar special page, let me know and we can send you the link 
to that or even the, the sheet, then that sale will be going up for the next 24 hours. So that, again, is a limited sale for that, too. But it's our way of thanking you for attending our webinar tonight. Thank you, Jim. So that, that was a really great technique. I really appreciate you sharing your tutorial with us. I know when I took my clutch uh, with me to the beauty salon to get my pink recharged, the ladies just absolutely loved it and they want one. <laughs> so it, it's a really fun project and it's so quick and easy to stitch out. I, I really think it's one of the best ones I've done in a long, long time. It even got the wow factor from my husband. So Whoa. good job. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly, are you out there? I sure am. This Jim, thank you so much for sharing this amazing technique. And you know, I know this is stretching my abilities. I have not done very much free motion or uh, freestanding lace techniques like this, and I'm excited to try it. And some of you out there, this might be something that is stretching your skills, and you might be excited to try new things. So I wanted to share with you some classes that we have going on. If you've enjoyed this webinar, you enjoy learning new things, you are going to love these classes. So the first one is Seasons with Sulky. It actually started yesterday. This is a great class. It's actually a certification class. So by taking this class, you are qualified to teach it at any store, any guild, anything. You can teach it to others. You are given the ability to photocopy the, uh, the lesson materials that we give you and teach this class. So if you've thought about teaching then Seasons is a great one to start with. With that $25 off coupon code, it's only $74. So that's a great price to just kind of start off your career or just to learn some really great techniques with some really great instructors. Um, the next one, it actually started on May 2nd, but you have plenty of time. We've extended the registration just for you. You can take our full certification class, which is the Magical Thread Art. There are 10 different projects, over 65 techniques, and you have expert, professional instructors that help you go through all those classes and help you every step of the way. So this is not like normal online classes where you're just watching a video and you email in questions. You actually have live instructors. You can upload your pictures of your projects and say this is where I'm having trouble or this is my successes. So that's another great course to take and you get a hundred bucks off. It is also a certification course so you can teach those classes wherever you choose to take, teach. The other class that we have up here doesn't start until July, but you can start registering now. We've given you a, a special coupon code to get $50 off. Artistry and Applique is five different classes, and they have all kinds of applique techniques. There is everything from free motion, zen doodling, zen tangling type techniques, to reverse applique, to using dupioni silk, to machine applique. It is a great class, great workshops. Um, it's not a, it's not as expensive because it's not a certification class, but you get the exact same professional help and teaching with all of those classes. And I am super excited because I have been preparing as well along with some of my other colleagues have been preparing some great new classes for you that they will be coming out in August. We've got Fearless Free Motion. Truly, if you have never even set your machine to the free motion stitch, this is the class to take. It's going to build on itself, so we will have a beginner, an intermediate, and an advanced class. We also are preparing another certification course and a class called Not Your Typical Table Toppers, which has all kinds of things to put on your table, including 3D and some things that, like it says, not your typical table topper. So look for those, and uh, we will hope to see you online for all those classes. Thanks, Kelly. You all have been really busy down there in Kennesaw. <laughs> We have, but I'm, I love I love putting classes together. So 
Um, and you know what? I I love webinars, and I love that you guys come and you hang out with us. So we want to give you some specials for doing it. So these are for you. They are only three hours. You are going to go to sulky.com slash web special. And actually, if you go into that handout section, you'll see one of the handouts says May 2016 promo. If you download that, it'll give you a live link right to that um, sulky.com slash web special. The first thing we have is 50% off the Blendables book. It has the instructions that Jim went over today in it, as well as some other fantastic projects. We also have great specials on stabilizer assortments. That includes Fabrisolvi, as well as some other great um, stabilizers, and the slimline boxes of Blendables Thread. And if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, I believe the slimline boxes are 30% off. I honestly do not remember what I talked him into for the stabilizer assortments, but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40% off. And that book with 50% off is a great value. So that's only for three hours, only till midnight. So uh, get over there and and uh, check out and start buying up our that uh, the book and the your blendable so you can make your purse. And that's a great way to stock yep. up on Salky supplies too, taking advantage of these web specials. Now, Kelly, um, before we go into uh, how to find us online, uh, we have a survey at the end of the webinar, right? Yes, we do. And I would love if you would take the survey. This really helps us to discover what it is you want us to find, want us to see, what to see. <laughs> In the next webinars, it helps us get feedback on just what you like, what you don't like, what we can improve, and who we can look at to come for our next webinars. And, uh, you know, the other thing about those specials is that these are really like the kind that we give on Black Friday this or on Cyber Monday. That's really the only other time we do discounts this deep. So um, these you aren't even going to get these kind of discounts uh, with a coupon in a, in a big box store so um, I, I think definitely a good value and if you aren't already following us online please check us out go to our website we've got free projects we've got free embroidery designs check out the blog we've got tutorials on there all the time and uh, follow us on Instagram on Facebook on all of those things and share with us your projects too anytime you hashtag sulky threads I will find it and I can um, comment and look at your stuff. We want to see how we're helping you to create with confidence and express yourself. Thanks, Kelly. And um, the survey will be at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to stay online a little longer. But when you leave the webinar, when you hit the big X or whatever, however it is you log out of the webinar, the survey will instantly pop up and you can go ahead and take that. So here are all the ways that you can find us online. Um, we have social media accounts with just about every network out there and Kelly is our social media manager so she's she takes charge of all of these that's a big job and she does the Pinterest and the Facebook posts and she just interacts with you guys in any outlet that she can yeah, love talking to our Silky fans anytime. Send me a, a comment on Facebook or Instagram or an, or email me on the blog. I'm, I'm happy to answer and, and chat with all of you. It's my favorite part. And this is Patty. I just want to say I didn't get everyone's questions answered tonight, but I got pretty close, and the rest will be answered in our handout. So don't despair if I missed you, and I apologize if I did. And you always for you. You always do such a fantastic job with that. <laughs> you make it so much easier for me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs>
So Tim, we have to thank you so much for coming on to this webinar and sharing with us your fantastic technique and giving us the tutorial for your clutch. I know a lot of people are inspired. I've seen some of the questions come through. The wheels are turning inside their heads and I just can't wait to see what they're going to do with this boucle lace. Yeah, well thank you for having me and I hope uh, they got a lot out of it too. Well, thank you, and don't forget to visit jimsuzio.com and take advantage of his 24-hour webinar special. So, Pat, uh, Ellen, is that our last slide? Looks that yes, way. I am. Yes, it All is. All right. Well, let's say good night to everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you in a couple months. Good night. Good, good night. night. Had a great time.